Thank you, Teresa. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to the Old Testament book of Jonah, chapter 2. It's our second week here, and this book, we'll be looking at it also in the next couple of weeks. So as you're turning there, you may know there's a popular saying that finds its source actually in the Bible, believe it or not. It's a saying that I'm sure each of us has heard, and it's this, be sure that your sin will find you out. Uh, you have probably told someone that, time, uh, that at some time, or maybe you yourself have heard that from someone else. There's a funny story in regard to my family uh, in this matter, uh, but my great uncle, my only uncle, my mom was an only child, my dad only had one sibling, and his brother was two or three years younger. His name was Bill Caldwell. In fact, my uh, first name is William and I'm named after my uncle. Um, he finished Appomattox County High School, went to the University of Richmond and never moved back to Appomattox from Richmond. He became principal at a large high school, J.R. Tucker High School in Henrico County and has since uh, retired. But the funny account was this, uh, there were times when my uncle was not very principal-like when he was a student. Uh, he could get in trouble from time to time. It may have just been that he was a teenage boy. It may have been that his mother died, my grandmother, when he, my uncle, was only 13 years of age. And don't get me wrong, he wasn't incorrigible or anything, but you know boys will be boys. So. Uh, when he was like in ninth grade, um, he came up with uh, a plan. Uh, he wanted to miss school. Uh, the high school team, he was not on the high school basketball team, but the high school basketball team was playing in the state championship. And the issue was this, they were playing during school hours. It wasn't in the evening, it was in the daytime. And so uh, I'm sure he convinced my great grandma, his grandma who was raising him at the time, uh, I want to go to the game. And as grandparents can do, they can be weak with grandchildren and she allowed him to go and he was at the game. The issue was this, the day after the game, I don't know if he convinced my great grandmother in it or if he forged her name, but he brought a note to the teacher and said, please excuse Bill uh, he was not feeling well yesterday. And the issue was this, uh, the game that he attended was broadcast on the radio back home. And my uncle was sitting directly behind the announcer shouting the entire game for like an hour and a half. And so when he brought that note, the teacher who had listened to the entire game knew that he was lying. Your sin will find you out. Jonah realized that. His sin found him out. The scripture says, and we looked in, in chapter one and verse three, uh, that he went down from the Lord's presence. He thought that he could escape from God. God had called him to go north and east into the city of Nineveh. Instead, he went south and west into Tarshish. He left from Joppa. He was hiding out in the bottom of the boat when everything was being tossed and turned and he really believed that he could get away from it, but in actuality, he did not and he could not. And so today, as we move from chapter one into chapter two, we see that uh, these reluctant seamen who cared more about Jonah than Jonah cared about them, who cared more about what God thought than in reality what Jonah thought in regard to God, we see that they did what Jonah said. They tossed him out of the boat. The sea became still for them, but trouble was just beginning for Jonah. We know that as he was tossed, he went, as we're gonna see, into the depths of the sea until God provided a fish uh, to swallow him. And so what we see here in chapter two is Jonah is sharing the account. We talked about the uniqueness last week of the book of Jonah, that among all of the prophetic books, while some of them contain narrative, that actually Jonah is 
entirely narrative. We talked about how it wasn't just the message that's emphasized, but the means to get that message as we see this reluctant prophet. We talked about how Jonah himself uh, did not author this because three out of the four chapters are written in the third person. However, as we look here, we see a personal account. The pronouns change from he to I and to my, and so we see that Jonah is actually relaying this account. Whoever is writing this may have well received this uh, oral history or this written history of what Jonah had to say about what actually happened. And so in chapter two, we see that it is both a prayer and a testimony. In prayer, he's talking to God. In testimony, Jonah, Jonah is talking about God. And so look with me, beginning in chapter 1, verse 17, reading through chapter 2. It said, The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. I cried out from help, for help from deep inside Sheol. You heard my voice. When you threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, the current overcame me. All your breakers and your billows swept over me. And I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. The water engulfed me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. I sank to the foundations of the mountains. The earth's gate shut behind me forever. Then you raised my life from the pit, Lord my God, as my life was fading away. I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah on the dry land. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word again today and we look at this reluctant prophet, Lord, a willing God and a resistant prophet. I pray you would speak to us today because, Lord, there are people all around us who, like the people of Nineveh, need to hear the good news that God loves them, that God has a plan for their lives, that this life is not just about the here and now, but that, Lord, you have placed eternity in our hearts and that, Lord, through faith in Jesus Christ, and faith alone in Christ, a person can be in right standing with you and experience the joy and the fulfillment that you desire for each of us to have in this life. And so, Lord, prepare our hearts to hear your message, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So again, we see here Jonah's prayer, but Jonah's prayer really moves, as we said a moment ago, into a testimony. And this morning, I want to note uh, some truths in this narrative. There's some things I want to look at briefly, I think, that are important uh, and we need to discuss as we look here in Jonah chapter 2. But from that, as we move toward the close of the message this morning, I want it really to hit home with us a truth that as we look at Jonah here, Jonah was concerned about himself. Jonah was rejoicing when God delivered him. But I appeal to you as we study the entirety of this book that God didn't just deliver Jonah for Jonah's sake, but he still had a mission. If Jonah had died in the bottom of that sea, he would not have been able to fulfill what God called him to do in the first place. And so uh, today as we study Jonah, might it be that we put ourselves in his place and say, God, what have you called me to do? To whom have you called me to go? And, and God, this life is not all about me, but it's about you and it's about others. So I want to look at just a few things before we move to, to the main point uh, this morning. And the first thing is this. As we look in Jonah, God is sovereign over everything that is happening. You know, there's a sincere prayer that is offered that is sincere, but sincerely wrong. And people will say it of goodwill. People who've been believers for a number of years will say it, and it sounds very good, and it goes like this. Lord, we give you this day. Lord, we give you this time. It's not ours to give. 
God is sovereign over all. Now it would be more accurate to say, Lord, we return to you this day because God is sovereign over everything. One thing that is a real just an eye opener as you study through Jonah is how the sovereignty of God is addressed. And it doesn't say God is sovereign over all, but what it is is throughout the narrative, we see God's sovereign hand orchestrating everything. In fact, we see it even in verse 17 of chapter one, it says the Lord appointed a great fish and that fish was to accomplish God's purpose. Uh, I'm very excited in a couple of weeks when we get to Jonah chapter four because it is literally one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. And it's interesting in that chapter what is said of God. In, in fact, in chapter four and verse six, it says he appointed a plant. In chapter four and verse seven, he appointed a worm. And then it says in chapter four and verse eight, God appointed an east wind. Something that is missed often as we study Jonah, we focus on the big fish, but we miss the little worm. God used a big fish to accomplish what he desired, and he used a tiny worm, an invertebrate. He used the east wind. In fact, Jesus said, uh, the wind blows and you know not where, where it comes from or where it goes. That's what he told Nicodemus. Yet here we see that he is controlling the wind in chapter four. And so as we look at it and we see God is sovereign over everything. God uses all of his created order to accomplish what he desires. And I want us to see he even used a reluctant prophet but there's a second point I think we need to focus on, not only the sovereignty of God, and he is just as sovereign today as he's ever been, but the second point is this, a low point can be a real time for personal reflection and discovery. You know, it says in verse five uh, of chapter two, this testimony um, uh, of Jonah, he says, the water engulfed me up to the neck, the watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. It's very interesting that while the sea calmed for the obedient sailors who did reluctantly uh, place this prophet, but obediently uh, into the water, we see that whereas their trouble began to ease, we see that the prophet's trouble uh, began to increase. In fact, he says in verse two, I called to the Lord and by distress, I cried out from the deep inside she Sheol. Sheol is the place of the dead. And the picture that we have here, a metaphoric picture, it's not literal Sheol because he was not there, but the water engulfed him. It surrounded him, it entrapped him. There was no escape. Even in the fish, there was nothing that he could do to provide escape. He was as good as dead and in trap. But it's very interesting that we see this man who was lying in the bottom of the ship at ease, was in comfort, and God puts him on his back, and he can only look up. And believe me, Jonah had a different view of matters when he was on his back. You know, I agree with a, a, a guy I was reading this week and his name was Eric Richmond. And he said this, J Jonah didn't just fall into the mouth of the fish. Some of the children's books may picture, you know, Jonah falling out of the ship and the fish with the mouth open, ready to catch him. But as we see here, there was a time of turmoil. There was a time of struggle. Seaweed was around his neck. And it says, all of my life was fading away. He said, and then, then I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. He was speaking about the time when he was struggling in the water and he said, everything was engulfed uh, around me. I was, I was struggling, but then I remembered you. Sometimes God uses personal crisis in order to get our attention. It's not that we pray or ask for it, but when we go through it, many times it's the one thing that can lead us to look up to God. And that's what Jonah did here. But I want you to see a, thir a third thing. God was still merciful to this disobedient prophet. And many times we can jump on our high horse, our soapbox, and we can 
say, look at Jonah. Look at how terrible he is. Look at what he did. All the time, we would be following the same pattern. You know, no one wants to be choked by seaweed. No one wants to be at the foundation of the mountains, which really means the very depths of the sea. But sometimes God sends us difficulties to accomplish His purpose. In fact, Hebrews 12, 6, for whom the Lord loves, He chastens. And so in this hardship, God was not only ministering to Jonah, but He was forming Jonah. He was developing Jonah into what he desired Jonah to be. He was working and he was molding Jonah. And it came through Jonah's hardship. And that hardship was caused by Jonah himself, but God was going to bring out good. Aren't you glad that God's a merciful God? As you look back at your life and you see times when you have been awry, when you see times when you were in rebellion against God, times when apathy marked your life and many people would say he or she would be done, God is there ready to minister. This fish that God sent was an act of mercy, an act of mercy to Jonah. And so God sent the fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah survived the turbulence of the depths of the sea. And he came out with a testimony. And we read that testimony in verses 8 and 9. Those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you, Lord, with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And so we see he had a testimony. And so God, who is sovereign, is working out all of this to accomplish not just his purpose in Jonah's life, but the higher purpose of what he desired to use Jonah to accomplish. We see that through difficulty, Jonah, uh, God had the attention of Jonah and how God sending the fish was an act of mercy. And so as we finish here in, in chapter 2, we feel pretty good about Jonah. I don't want to rain on your parade. But not all was good. In fact, there still was a lot that was very bad. There were still things in Jonah's heart and life that were awry. He had moved from comfort in the ship to discomfort in the water to comfort again as he shared testimony of what God had seen him through. He had a prayer. He had a testimony. But there's something big that was wrong. And we're going to see it. In chapter 3 and chapter 4, listen, he still did not have a heart for the mission God had given him. He still did not have the will to do what God wanted him to do. He would go to Nineveh, but he would go reluctantly. And the salvation that he loudly proclaimed, and I wonder who was the audience at the end of verse 9, was not willingly proclaimed to the city of Nineveh. Last week we talked about how we need a heart, a heart for people who don't know Jesus Christ, how we need a will that is conformed to the will of God who desires that none should perish and that all should come to repentance. And primary among our witness is those who do not know Jesus Christ. Jonah was very happy that God delivered him here. He even said salvation belongs to God, but he was not so happy when that message of salvation would be carried to people he did not feel worthy to believe on the Lord. And so today, I want to look at three practical things that we can do. First, it's important before we look at these three things, we need to have a heart to see people come to know the Lord. We need to find great joy in it. Uh, we need to find great desire in it. We need to have a will that is conformed to the will of God, not only to see people saved that they might be saved, but because there's rejoicing in heaven for those who would believe. And it would be a blessing that God would use us as an instrument to draw someone to Him. And so I want to look at three practical things that we can do to equip ourselves to be effective witnesses for the Lord. Because as God brought Jonah out, Jonah's saying, boy, man, he was exhaling. This is great. Salvation belongs to God. And God is saying, I still have something 
for you to do. It's very interesting as I went back and read chapter 2, 22 times in this chapter alone, the words I, me, or my are used. He says, I have received. It is my and it's mine. It's a great testimony in prayer. But as we look at Jonah's life, we see he was living in the first person. He was egocentric. He loved the Lord's deliverance of himself. And he was ready to tell people that, but it was all focused on him. But it was more than about Jonah. People needed to hear about God. They needed what we too have. And for us today, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He needed to move from receiving a blessing to being a blessing. You know, there are many believers today who never moved from receiving a blessing to being a blessing. They've never been used of God in order to, to share Christ or to pray for individuals who need to know Christ. There, there, there are many people who have attended church every Sunday and maybe never invited someone to join them. But I want to look at three things, three things today that we can do. And easily hidden in this narrative is that God is moving Jonah toward Nineveh. Jonah's saying, man, I got out of that. I got by the skin of my teeth. I thought I was going to die. This stuff, the seaweed was around my neck. And God all the time is saying, prophet, you're not understanding. I'm not delivering you for you, just for you. I love you. I'm merciful to you. I'm delivering you because you have a task. And you and I have a task today. So what are the three things? The first thing you can do in regard to people who do not know Jesus is pray. You can pray. First, pray for yourself. Lord, give me a heart for so-and-so. Um, we passed out some uh, bookmarks uh, a couple of weeks ago. Individuals you can pray for leading up to the crusade. That, that's not a small thing. In fact, uh, you should have a list of five to ten people you know who do not know Jesus that you should be praying for regularly. Someone said you need to talk to God about people as you go to talk to people about God. And so you pray. You pray for, for having a heart. God, give me a heart for this person. But then you pray and you move that. Lord, move in the heart of so-and-so. Move in her heart, Lord. Orchestrate events. Move in his heart. Do this, uh, that they might come to know you. This past week, I was reading in Acts chapter 10, and we see this twofold prayer, how it is acted out in a genuine witnessing encounter. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, who was a God-fearer but didn't know the Lord, received a vision, and God told him to go. And he went to Peter. At the same time, God was working in the witnesser's life, Peter. And Peter had a vision and he saw this sheet come down with all types of what he considered to be unclean food. God said, take and eat. He said, I would never do it. It's unclean. God said, don't call unclean. What I have decided is clean. What he meant was he was sending him to witness to a Gentile. So we see here, it's almost two different scenes. Here's Cornelius. He's the one who needs to hear, and God is prompting his life to be in a position to hear. Here's Peter who has the message, and God is prompting him. The two come together, and guess what? Cornelius becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we pray, God, work in my life. God, work in my witness. God, work in that other person's life who doesn't know you. The second thing that we can do is serve. And that's really where the go begins. Don't get me wrong, uh, Ben Lehman uh, discipled me in personal evangelism. I had the best of the best to do that. Uh, but when we began, and Karen was involved in this at seminary, a lot of times we just knocked on doors. And don't get me wrong, the seed is still being planted. But how much more effective can it be if it's somebody we know that doesn't know the Lord, who knows us, who knows we care about them, and that naturally happens. Now, God can use both. But often, 
God uses our serving other people. We minister in the name of Jesus Christ. Let me illustrate it to you this way. I heard a story a number of years ago of a couple. They were an older couple, not really old, but they were empty nesters. The wife was devoted to the Lord. She loved the Lord, attended church, um, just had a great fervor for the Lord. But the husband had no desire for the things of God, none at all. And, and for a while, she asked her husband to attend worship, and, and, and he wouldn't. He said, I'm, I'm not into that. I, 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 there are a bunch of people in the church I don't care about, and he wouldn't go. Well, in time, the lady became very ill. I mean, ill almost to the point of death. She was gravely ill, couldn't do anything. And the men and women of the church began to minister to that man. They fixed meals. They cut the grass. They took care of leaves. They did all of these things. They showed that they really cared about that family. Well, the lady amazingly was healed. She got much better. She decided one day to go to church. And she didn't even have to ask her husband. He said, I think I'll go to church with you today. And he went to church. The preacher preached a message. He got saved. The preacher went back in his study afterward, put his message on file, and he said, I'm going to save this message. This is a great message. This guy got saved. Now, what really impacted that man? Believers who loved him. If you love God and you love people, you serve people. And that is where it begins. Salt and light, salt and light, proximity. We go to them. Uh, God is telling Jonah, go, and we proclaim that message. And so we pray for them. We pray for ourselves. We go and serve. But then third, it's important that we witness. You know, the sad thing about verse 9 he says in the last <clears throat> five words of that verse, salvation belongs to the Lord. He had a message, but no recipients. He had a message, but he wasn't around people who needed to hear it. And so as we look at praying and we look at serving, we're building a bridge to cross over. That, that we serve others, not just so that they can say, oh, that's a good person. We serve others so that they may know Christ. And so it's important that we verbally share the reason for the hope that we have. And there are three ways you can give a verbal witness. One is develop a personal testimony. Now, each year here at Concord, whether it be on Wednesday evenings or other times of the year, we have spent time training how to share a personal testimony. Now, a personal testimony is not typically a 30-minute talk. It is not something that people are going to sit and listen to, much as you're a captive audience today. You may only have two or three minutes, and it is simply put, the outline is this, my life before I came to know Christ, how I came to know Christ, and how Christ has changed my life. Every believer should have a personal testimony. I was talking to somebody the other day. They said in their toolbox at home, every time they need a Phillips head screwdriver, they have a flat one. Every time they need a flat one, they need a Phillips head. And I was thinking, just buy both and you'll be set. If you're going to work on something, you have to have the tools in the toolbox. If we're going to be a witness for Christ, our personal testimony is a tool that God can use. I've heard people say before, I want to go on the mission field. What's the first step? If you're going to go on the foreign mission field, you need to get a passport. All right? You can't, you can't just jump that. There's got to be some preparation. So if we're going to be effective witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're going to be able to effectively share, one thing that is essential is we need to possess a personal testimony. And we'll be going through training. We'll take a break on Wednesday nights and we'll let you know ahead when we'll go through that this fall again. But developing a personal testimony. It's important that every one of us 
have that. Second is this, just invite someone to church. Invite somebody. It actually works. I see Russell back there. I brag on him a little bit. He's probably as responsible as anybody for a number of people who have come to this church. I think of Scott and Heather Stevens and Jimmy Alexander. I think of Ben Clark. I think of a number of people that he has just invited. I love what Russell will do. He'll do a favor for somebody and then instead of taking money, he'll say, well, come on to church with me. You see what? The personal invitation. It actually works. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Associated Association said 82% of unchurched people would come to church if just a friend or family member would invite them. But too many times we're afraid. We're afraid that we would offend. But if we truly believe the gospel, we would want to do that. Listen to me. This crusade that is coming up September 29th to October 2nd is big. Make no mistake about it. It's enormous. Because the whole intent of this is that people would accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Where should we want to be? You say, well, I'm already saved. Well, we talked about you can be doing that first thing, praying for people who are there. You can be inviting someone. When you go and you take someone with you, then that person is able to hear. And so we can invite. We can invite people. You may not feel comfortable with words. You may say, I, I don't know if I can get every uh, T crossed and every I dotted, but you sure can say, just come with me to hear the word of God. And so you can develop a testimony, you can invite, and then you can learn a simple way to share the gospel. It could be the three circles. Karen is big on that. It could be the Roman road. These things you may not be familiar with, but they're easy things. You can say, how can I lead someone to Christ? Develop a simple plan, because the scripture says, how can they believe without someone sharing? The sad thing about Jonah as we go through this is he really missed out on the joy of seeing God use him to bring people to a saving knowledge of him. We're going to see some exciting things, though, in the next couple of weeks. We're going to see God working through creation again to accomplish his purpose. We're going to see a, a wicked city, and we're going to look more at that wicked city next week, and a wicked emperor who are repenting and humbling themselves before God. But I want you to see it all began after the fish spewed Jonah out of his mouth. For Jonah, that was the story, and that's where it went. For God, he was just beginning. Guess what? God has saved you for the same purpose. Not so that you can give some random testimony out in the open air with no one around. God has given you a word that you might be able to go, and you might be able to serve. You might be able to pray. You might be able to share testimony. You might be able to witness. And guess what? You're not responsible for the result. You plant the seed. God will give the increase. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this first person narrative today and what you did in Jonah's life. You can do spiritually in anyone's life who would turn to you. Lord, we thank you that you're sovereign and you're working through all of history to accomplish your purpose. We thank you that you're merciful. You use even the hardships in our lives to set our eyes on you. But Lord, let us not miss the, the focus of this entire book, that Lord, you care for lost people, people that we may discount, that we may disregard. God, you died for them. You have a heart for them. You have a desire to see them saved. Help us to have a heart. And a desire. Lord, help us to put to practice these things today. It may be to work on that personal testimony. It may be to begin to pray sincerely for people who don't know you, to, to develop a, a simple way, Lord, to share our faith. It may be to invite someone to come to this crusade in, in, in the coming weeks or to church. Lord, 
we pray that your word would not fall on empty ears, but that, Lord, we would um, put legs to what you've called us to do in the church, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.